Whew. Okay, I've got a good feeling about this. <laughs> Greetings everyone, and happy May the 4th. Today we're going to be talking about Star Wars. Now, you probably haven't heard of this franchise before, it's not really spoken about that much on the internet, and I think that's because it's one of those things which everyone just kind of universally agrees upon, you know? It's a very uncontroversial topic of discussion, that's all I'm saying, and it helps that the franchise is being handled <laughs> so well at the moment. <laughs> But seriously, today is in fact Star Wars Day, so what I thought we could do to commemorate this sacred holiday is to rank all 11 live-action Star Wars movies we have received thus far, both from George Lucas and from Disney. In a cheeky, quick-fire, May the 4th edition of everyone's favourite series on the channel, Worst to Best. Now, like I've already said, this isn't going to be some long, epic, extensive deep dive like I usually do. If you want that, go check out my Christopher Nolan or Stanley Kubrick videos or whatever, nor am I going to give a really in-depth scene-by-scene analysis of each movie, like that one, I don't know, 46-minute breakdown of Return of the Jedi I did at the start of this year. No, this is going to be a chill, breezy drive-by of that oh-so-iconic galaxy far, far away. Perhaps somewhere down the line I'll go a bit more in-depth, but for now we're just gonna take it easy. And you know what, because today is a public holiday, we're gonna have some fun with this video. <laughs> I'm not gonna hold back, okay? <laughs> you are probably going to find some of my takes outrageous, or god forbid, you might even end up agreeing with some of them, but let's all remember, it's just Star Wars, they're just movies, and there's no need for me or you to be overly dramatic or emotional. But with that being said, I genuinely think The Rise of Skywalker is one of the worst films of all time. Now, usually when people use that phrase, they're talking about movies which essentially fail in every single aspect. You know, acting, story, cinematography, budget. These are your samurai cops, your plan line from outer spaces, your The Rooms. However, I would argue that the films we should truly be crowning the worst of all time are the big budget, bland, lifeless, corporate slodges which are unfortunately becoming more and more common these days. Because look, whatever you want to say about The Room, you can't deny that it's worth watching, it's funny, it's well-intentioned, and most importantly, <laughs> it has a soul. The Rise of Skywalker, on the other hand, I mean, sure, it's competently made from a technical standpoint. It contains a score from one of the greatest composers of all time. I guess some of the acting and visuals are okay. But make no mistake, The Rise of Skywalker is a vapid, empty, and honestly, rather sad film. It's the amalgamation of a trilogy made by people who, let's face it, had no idea what they were doing, who had no plan in place, as well as being a reaction to the backlash of a movie which was a reaction to the backlash of a movie which was a reaction to the backlash of a trilogy. It's essentially two hours and 22 minutes of Disney trying to mop up their multitude of past mistakes, leaving little to no time to actually, you know, wrap up the uh, legendary iconic space opera that the gods should have never allowed them to buy. And on top of that, it's just awfully written. I mean, all the stuff with Palpatine coming back in the opening crawl, and that whole scavenger hunt thing they go on, it's genuinely one of the most putrid, dead-on-arrival corporate catastrophes I've ever seen. Like, at least the prequels had ambition, at least The Last Jedi was trying to do something. And look, you can hate on The Last Jedi as much as you want, believe me, I get it. But you have to admit that The Rise of Skywalker just retconning all the stuff in that film was such a cowardly move from Disney. Like, if you're gonna go down a certain path, at least have the balls to stick to it. Yeah, this movie is worthless, it's actually impressive how bad it is, and that's all I really have to say. Okay, before I begin, I wanted to quickly say that at the end of the day, this video is basically just me having a laugh about Star Wars and voicing my opinions on the franchise. What I am not trying to do is to tell people that their opinions are wrong or that they shouldn't enjoy something. But with that out of the way, here is a very brief summary of why I don't like the prequels. So in the original trilogy, we're introduced to this incredibly creative and diverse magical world, filled to the brim with charismatic characters, deep interesting lore, and a simple but riveting story. 
story. Yes, of course, it's all happening in a made-up fantasy setting, but there's something about those three movies which make them feel very real and tangible and grounded, which makes me believe that all those awesome things really did happen a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I think this has a lot to do with their excellent practical effects, which were lauded at the time, which still look real 40 years on, and which will probably continue to look real until the end of time because that's how practical effects work. But they also just happen to be really fun, exciting, and well-paced movies with a lot of passion and imagination and, most importantly, heart. In many ways, they are the definition of lightning in a bottle. The prequels, on the other hand, have absolutely none of this. They are the opposite of lightning in a bottle. They are... I mean, feces in a teacup. <laughs> And it's to the point where they don't even feel like they're taking place in the same universe as the originals. To the point where I honestly get the feeling George Lucas never once actually re-watched the original trilogy after making it, to remind him on what made those three movies so special in the first place. And this is no more clear than in Attack of the Clones, which is only above The Rise of Skywalker in this list because, while yes, I genuinely feel like I'm being gaslit by all the other people of my generation, when they tell me that the prequels are... secretly genius? I can at least admit that they do have this bittersweet spark of originality and potential, which the sequels, but especially The Rise of Skywalker, does not have. But just because the prequels are slightly more imaginative than the sequels, that does not make the prequels good. People often like to say, the prequels may have been bad in execution, but hey, they had some good ideas, so I guess it evens out. Um, yeah, no, it does not even out, my friend. Not even a bit. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Execution is the most important thing in a film. Like, it's literally the most important thing. It's basically the only thing. Plus, all the good ideas which people cite the prequels for coming up with, you know, the tragic fall of the Jedi and Anakin Skywalker, the rise of the Empire and all its Shakespearean pathos or whatever, yeah, that all comes from the original trilogy. Like, the prequels cannot claim any of those ideas. Honestly, using this logic, you could argue that The Last Airbender is an artistic masterpiece. Well, its execution may have not been very good, but at least it had some interesting ideas. Well, actually, no. It's just piggybacking off the themes and lore of a far superior source material, completely failing at every step, all the while bringing nothing that is actually new or interesting to the table. And then there's the idea of respecting the original trilogy. This one <laughs> really makes me laugh. Modern Star Wars fans often like to discuss how the sequels completely disrespected characters like Luke, Han, and Leia. And honestly, I completely agree, and we'll talk about that more in a bit. But are you really going to tell me that Attack of the Clones is respectful to the original trilogy? Are you really going to tell me that The Last Jedi's portrayal of Luke is disgusting, but Attack of the Clones handled characters like Anakin and Yoda with such loving care? I'm haunted by the kiss that you should never have given me. This is Darth Vader guys. This is who the prequels say Darth Vader is. Oh no, but it's so respectful. These get to be Star Wars movies. They were actually beautiful pieces of art the entire time. But the sequels? Nah, they just don't get the original trilogy at all. Not like the prequels do. I mean, Christ. And, <laughs> and the Jedi. I mean, people often complain on the internet these days about how unfair it is that Rey is now the one rebuilding the Jedi Order and not Luke. And I'm just sat here like, why do you even want this so-called order to be rebuilt in the first place? I mean, sure, maybe the one Obi-Wan talks about in the original Star Wars, they sound awesome. But this sterile committee of incompetent farts? I think I'd rather have the Empire in charge. It is such blatant character and lore assassination, and no one seems to talk about it. Because in the original trilogy, the Jedi seem awesome. We don't see or hear about them too much, but everything we do get hints towards this sacred group of badass, deeply spiritual, sci-fi, peacekeeping monks with laser swords. Watching these films, I can completely understand why everyone back in the late 70s and 80s wanted to be a Jedi. Well, it's too bad that the prequels revealed them to be the most boring, lame, and incompetent people in the galaxy. Seriously, how are you going to cast Sam L. Jackson and even have him just be some bland guy with no personality. None of these people seem like they've ever told a joke before. In fact, none of the characters in the entire trilogy do. George Lucas says these films are supposed to be for kids, so why did he forget to add any charisma or fun to any of the characters? <laughs> I mean, that one scene in Empire where Han has to hit the Falcon for the power to come on literally shows more character than everything in this trilogy combined. And I know prequel fans like to say, nah bro, they're supposed to be like stoic Buddhist monks, bro. Yeah, have you actually 
actually met a Buddhist monk before, because I have, and trust me, they are literally the chillest people in the world. Shocker, when you meditate every day and let go of your earthly attachments, you actually become pretty likeable. I guess George Lucas didn't get the memo. Then there's the argument that the Jedi had to be weak, you know, on the decline in this trilogy, in order to be defeated and overthrown. And yeah, I guess that's a good point, but also, why did it have to be that way? Why did the incompetence of the Jedi have to be the reason they ended up dying out, instead of it just being the strength of Sheev Palpatine? <laughs> Which is, by the way, a horrible name for a Dark Lord, I'm just gonna call him the Emperor from now on. It makes the Emperor seem far less capable, like, I'm pretty sure I could have overthrown the Jedi Order considering just how useless they are in these movies, without having this impossibly complicated plan. Anyway, that's enough prequel bashing for now, I think. Let's get back to sequel bashing. The garbage will do. Yeah, you can say that again. People often like to cite The Last Jedi as the thing which ruined this modern era of Star Wars, but I'm gonna argue that it's actually The Force Awakens that carries that mantle. This is easily one of the laziest films ever written, but the funny thing is, when The Force Awakens initially hit theaters, it was a huge success. And who could blame them? It was the first Star Wars film since 1983, which contained actual filmmaking, and acting, and fun. Yet, eight years and two incredibly messy sequels later, that opening shot of an Empire, sorry, I mean, First Order ship, gliding across the frame is really starting to look more like a middle finger to all fans of Star Wars, courtesy of Mickey Mouse himself. The Force Awakens literally feels like it was written by AI. There is not a single shred of genuine humanity, originality, or passion at any point in this movie. It is pure, unabashed conveyor belt filmmaking, only equaled by the MCU's most soulless, stale cash grabs. <laughs> By the title Cruel, all the efforts of the original trilogy have been undone. Both the universe and the heroes who inhabit it have been reverted back to their pre-episode 4 starting positions. It's an astoundingly bizarre and ultimately disastrous creative decision, birthed from a rushed script and one of the greediest companies around. Because, sure, the nostalgic legacy rehash is a safe and easy route to initial delirium and an instant cash flow. But what happens after the viewer leaves the theatre, gets in their car, and the reality of what they've just seen slowly sinks in? I understand that Disney needed to reunite to the fandom after the prequels and George Lucas becoming one with the Force, but something tells me that erasing the previous 38 years of Star Wars content was not the way to do this. Guys, the slate you had was legendary. Why wipe it clean? The sad thing is, writing aside, the Force Awakens is not even that terrible of a movie, at least for like the first 30 minutes. Don't get me wrong, the First Order actually suck Wookiee balls and are some of the least effective, least scary villains in film history, but the combination of some beautiful wide shots, inspiring practical effects, and Williams' score, it's alright, you know, no one's completely immune to nostalgia bait. Isaac, Ford, and Nyong'o all give great performances, although the standout here is probably John Boyega, whose character at this point had not yet been forgotten about. I even don't mind Rey in the beginning, at least until her character has to lean on an actual script. But there reaches a point, about half an hour in, where the iconography just stops being enough and where The Force Awakens goes back to sleep. Look, this entire so-called sequel trilogy drowns in the melancholy of missed opportunity, but there's something especially haunting about watching its first instalment in the present day, because by trying so hard to be nothing like the prequels, The Force Awakens became the very thing it swore to destroy. It's a boring movie. I was going to write a whole monologue on George Lucas and Disney and mythology and capitalism and good versus evil, but honestly, who cares? We all know what this movie is. It's the beginning of a trilogy so pathetic and hollow, it's convinced people that the prequels are masterpieces or whatever. Yeah, oh dear. Okay, so I'll keep this short, we all know how much this film has been talked about to death on the internet. The Last Jedi suffers greatly from the shortcomings of The Force Awakens, most importantly the decision to undo the entire original trilogy and all its characters. Thanks Disney. <laughs> I don't know why I'm still watching The Empire vs. The Rebellion, I don't care about any of this, it is so mind-blowingly alienating and unoriginal and depressing. And for this reason, 
I don't hate Ryan Johnson, I don't think he ruined my childhood, and I'm not gonna spend my precious time on this beautiful earth sending him death threats on Twitter. An attempt has clearly been made here to inject some life into this doomed trilogy, and for that, the man has my respect. Does it all work for me? Of course not. In fact, most of it doesn't. The film is shot and edited beautifully, but I can't stand Johnson's Joss Whedon-y dialogue. Seriously, let's go Chrome Dome? <laughs> is right up there with Somehow Palpatine Returned and Only a Sith Deals in Absolutes for the worst line in Star Wars history. Nor do I enjoy the direction he takes any of the characters, Luke being the most obvious example, who here is treated almost as badly as his father was during the prequel trilogy. But I'll say it again, I don't really blame Ryan Johnson for this. The torch he was passed was out before he ever got his hands on it. And while I don't particularly like what he did with its extinguished remains, it is the best in the sequel trilogy by default, as it's the only entry which actually somewhat resembles a film, and not just the product of Disney's bland, corporate conveyor belt, which gave us such classics as Ant-Man Quantumania and the live-action Mulan. So, yeah. I've definitely cooled down on my hate for Revenge of the Sith over time. Don't get me wrong, any time I hear anyone claiming this thing to be some uh, beautiful, tragic Shakespearean masterpiece, I genuinely start to question the very fabric of my reality. I mean, guys, just read Hamlet, read Macbeth, please. <laughs> but at least now, on the incredibly rare occasion that I do rewatch Revenge of the Sith, I don't want to set myself on fire. And I think that's because despite basically being just as flawed as the other two films, with the Spy Kids 3 level CGI, dreadful characterization which defecates on the original trilogy, and the dialogue which sounds like it was written by a 10 year old who was raised by robots, at least something occasionally interesting happens. The opening of this film, for example, is all right, you know, it's pretty fun. I actually find the lightsaber duel between Anakin and Dooku to be like the best live action fight outside of the original trilogy. I know everyone says the one at the end is the best, but I don't know, I kind of prefer this one. It doesn't have the, uh, what is it? Um, if you're not with me, then you're my enemy line. <laughs> Nah, it's Shakespearean, guys, it's Shakespearean, trust me. There's there's even a bit where Palpatine says he's too dangerous to be kept alive, and then Mace Windu repeats it later. So deep, it's basically King Lear. <laughs> but seriously, Revenge of the Sith is, in my opinion, far from the tragic, nuanced piece of art many people claim it to be nowadays. And the funny thing is, the biggest argument prequel fans make defending this trilogy is, ah, oh, this trilogy may have some problems, but at least it had a planned out, coherent storyline, unlike the sequel, and, okay, first of all, having a story which wasn't made up as the filmmakers went along should be the bare minimum, like, that is such a low bar to set. But second of all, what are you talking about? Planned out and coherent story. The prequels, that's what we're saying now. We've gone from, these are the worst films of all time, to, it's okay to like them, to, well, they actually had some really good ideas, to, they were a Shakespearean masterpiece, like, what is going on? Planned out and coherent story. The trilogy with like 17 different villains. The trilogy where 80% of the story happens in the final movie. The trilogy whose first film people recommend to leave out when marathoning the franchise. Maybe I'm just being an asshole. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being mean. Or maybe I actually remember the original trilogy and believe George Lucas was capable of so much more than this. Like, imagine how good these movies could have been. You can say no one hates Star Wars as much as Star Wars fans, but I would argue that no one actually appreciates Star Wars more than Star Wars fans. We know what this franchise can be when it's firing on all cylinders, because we've seen it. And it's why I find stuff like the prequel and sequel trilogies to be such a shame. But, oh well. <laughs> Solo, A Star Wars Story is fine, you know? It's an okay standalone adventure, which really isn't doing enough to ruin anything about the greater Star Wars lore. So I guess by that logic, it is better than the sequels and most of the prequels. But it doesn't really add anything either. 
It's not doing anything that interesting, and on top of this, it's honestly one of the worst looking movies I've ever seen. Seriously, why is this thing so brown? What is going on? This was shot by the same guy who did Arrival. Anyway, Alden Ehrenreich is a good Han, which is actually kind of remarkable if you think about it, considering how big those shoes were. I also like Donald Glover as Lando, I kind of wish he was in the movie more. And look, I think if you cut this down a bit, maybe got rid of Amelia Clarke's character, you'd have a pretty solid episode of some I don't know, live action Star Wars anthology type show. But I also think Han's one of those characters it's better to know less about. And yeah, that's it basically. It's okay, it's fine. Yeah, it may be surprising that someone who clearly doesn't like the prequels is putting what is often cited as the worst of the trilogy all the way at number 5, but to be honest, I am somewhat of a Phantom Menace apologist these days. Yes, it contains most of the same flaws as both Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, but I guess while watching those movies feels like I'm playing a badly written PlayStation 1 game, there's something about the Phantom Menace which feels quite special. Maybe it's something to do with the very strong New Testament imagery of, you know, finding some prophetic spiritual child in the middle of a desert who's gonna save us all, but I reckon it's also just the case of the Phantom Menace being too much of a side quest to seriously mess up the canon and ruin childhoods like the other two prequels. Then there's the case of it being the only prequel shot on film, and also still somewhat relying on practical effects. And yeah, I know that the entire prequel trilogy used more practical effects than the entire original trilogy or whatever the stat is, but I judge by results, not methods, and it doesn't take a genius to work out that this looks a million times better than this. So yeah, Phantom Menace, it's not a great film, but there is something about The Phantom Menace which I kind of like. It reminds me of a point in time where the prequels were still salvageable, and you know, Jewel of the Fate, Darth Maul. It's fun. I like Watto. <laughs> It's just interesting, I don't know. It has a bit of heart, that's all I'm saying, so fair play. Yeah! The good ones! <laughs> okay, I'll keep this one very short, as like I've already said, I have made a 46 minute video about this movie. But to summarise, I basically see Return of the Jedi as both the best and worst of Star Wars, and to a greater extent, the best and worst of George Lucas. Compared to the previous two films in the trilogy, Jedi is disappointing, especially from a structural and pacing point of view. Its first act is basically just there to save Han Solo, who is a shell of his usual self in this film and who doesn't really do anything for the rest of the movie. Its second act is the original trilogy's lowest point by far, in that basically nothing happens other than wacky juvenile Ewok hijinks. Seriously, compare this to the second act of the other two movies and you'll realise just how poor it really is. However, its third act does go pretty hard, especially the space battle with Lando and Admiral Akbar, and of course the final confrontation between Luke and Vader, which is so good and cathartic, it just about redeems the rest of the film. And plus, it's the original trilogy, man, it still has that heart and soul which the Star Wars live action movies were never really able to capture again, except for of course. Man, that title is so long it doesn't even fit onto the page. <laughs> okay, look, I'll be honest. Rogue One's first 30 minutes are pretty shaky. It doesn't really feel like the movie knows what it wants to be, the editing is kind of choppy, and overall the film feels a bit off. But once the stakes are established, once we are introduced to our cast of characters, this film does, in my opinion, turn into a pretty great Star Wars movie, with the third act especially going incredibly hard. I mean, people like to talk about that Vader hallway scene, and yes, of course, it's awesome, but honestly, the whole final hour of this film, I think, is consistently great. It strikes that perfect balance between capturing the soul of the original trilogy, while of course striking out and doing its own thing. And people like to often talk about how, yeah, the action and cinematography are great, but what really lets down Rogue One is the characters. But I completely disagree, okay? It's like what I was talking about with Inception. When you have these heist sort of movies where the goal is the mission, you don't need to have like seven or eight in-depth characters. You don't need to know everyone's backstories. All they really need to be is likeable. And likeable they are here, especially my boy Chirrut. This is what a Jedi should be, <laughs> you know? I know he's technically not a Jedi, but you know what I mean. 
He's like Uncle Iroh, you know, he's got the wisdom and stoicism and spiritual energy, but he's also this lovable, funny bloke who can probably kick your ass. Plus, the way he goes out, I mean, the way all the characters go out, it's pretty ballsy. I mean, how many big franchise movies like this have you ever seen which end up killing off all its characters in the end? Plus, this film gave us Andor, which is like the best Star Wars thing we've gotten since The Empire Strikes Back, so there you go. <laughs> The fact I'm calling this thing Star Wars and not A New Hope probably tells you what kind of Star Wars fan I am more than anything else in this video. Despite everyone else my age being a die-hard prequel defender, I am indeed an OG, traditional, despecialized Star Wars fan. <laughs> you know, give me Yubnub, give me Han shooting first, and give me Sebastian Shaw, hashtag my Anakin. <laughs> I'll be honest, this is probably my most watched film ever, and it probably always will be. It's the movie so good that people are still trying to recreate its magic 46 years later. Every single frame, every single prop, every single sound effect in this thing is just iconic. You already know what this film is, you can probably quote the entire thing just like me. Owen, he can't stay here forever, most of his friends have gone. It means so much to him. I'll make it up to him next year, I promise. Luke's just not a farmer, Owen. He has too much of his father in him. That's what I'm afraid of. Oh, it's just so good. <laughs> and yet, somehow, The Empire Strikes Back is better. I used to prefer the original, I used to not really understand people who thought this one was better, but to be honest with you guys, the older I get, the more I appreciate this film. It's actually, in my opinion, one of those very rare, perfect movies. Like, I've never said anything like this before on the channel, but this is easily in my top 10 films of all time. It might even be a top 5. From the first act on Hoth, which perfectly reintroduces the characters in the midst of a galactic civil war, from the second act, which for me is the highest point Star Wars has ever got, when Luke is learning about the Force from Yoda. This is a Jedi, guys. <laughs> this is what it means to be a Jedi. Dagobah and Yoda both just feel so real. It's kind of incredible that they're not. There's so many iconic scenes here. Yoda lifting the X-Wing out of the swamp, probably being my favourite. And of course, this is all running parallel with Han, Leia, Chewie, and 3PO in the Millennium Falcon. The chemistry of Ford and Fisher is off the charts. I don't think a character has ever been as cool as Han in Empire. And then the third act, which brings it all together. We get Lando, we get Boba Fett, we get I Love You, I Know, we get I Am Your Father. It's just goated. It's a goated movie. This is what Star Wars can be at its best. Yes, it's fun, yes, it's incredibly well made, but honestly, it's more than that. It's art, it's pure magic, and that's all I really have to say. I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> I made this whole video in like two days, if you uh, couldn't tell. Happy May the 4th, everyone. Enjoy your blue milk and death sticks. Sorry if I hated on your favorite Star Wars movie in this video. It was just a bit of fun, but I'm gonna go to bed now. Okay.